come around about noon tomorrow. What are you doing up there? Are you writing a book cover? Really? Really. Let the woman I love die before your eyes. That's right. That's right. Hi guys, hello and welcome back to yet another video on this study tube project. My name is Luke Birch and for today's brand new video I'm going to be giving you a media film slash history lesson. For those of you that don't know me, I have just finished my degree at the University of Lincoln studying film and television. I also just so happen to be at my husband's apartment in Los Angeles, California or more specifically Hollywood. Obviously you guys may know it doesn't take a film student to be aware that Los Angeles or Hollywood is still considered the entertainment capital of the world. Back in the early days of the film industry at the late 1800s, early 1900s, Hollywood was the big dog. Ding! Hollywood had the crown. But in today's day and age, that is no longer the case. I think Chinese and Indian cinema do much better domestically than US films do in the United States these days. The film industry is ever changing around the world. It's becoming more and more international and it's no longer Hollywood is the big dog. I mean, sure, it's still, you know, got big corners, but it's not the biggest. There are loads of film hubs around the world, London, Canada, Mumbai, China, France, Berlin, pretty much everywhere. But from a film student and historian's perspective, you could argue that Hollywood cinema is perhaps the most interesting to learn from in terms of things like censorship and just how powerful Hollywood cinema was. For today's brand new video, I'm going to be teaching you guys about the one piece of legislation or censorship that arguably had the biggest effect in Hollywood cinema that still can be traced to representations in contemporary Hollywood cinema. You don't want to miss this, it's actually quite interesting. Even if you're not interested in film, this is somewhat interesting. Just for history, honey. Ladies and gentlemen, today's film is going to be on the production code of 1934. Wait. I'll clogged on, it's actually somewhat interesting. First of all, Film Basics 101, you must understand just how significant and important Hollywood cinema was, and I guess still is. You know, if we compare it to artists, you know, cinema was the Beyonce of mediums in the 1930s. It was. The radio was on, but it was banging, but not popping. The cinema was popping, this was just banging. You must understand this. So many people went to the cinema. These other gals could never. Cinema, first of all, started off silent and black and white for quote unquote entertainment purposes. But then in 1927, something came to cinema to shake the table. Sound. Sound impacted the cinema like you would never believe. Suddenly you had so many actors that became out of work. You know, they might have looked good, they could do a bit of mine, bit of mine, but boof, they couldn't act with their voices or they just sounded weird in the eyes of Hollywood, honey. We don't judge. Sound dropping in the cinema, it was like the iPhone dropping. It was huge. It changed cinema so quickly, so rapidly. <laughs> Everything was going on. Then a lot of the big wigs, you know, these mysterious, powerful, like public leaders or politicians in the US, they said, whoa, whoa, whoa. There was this sudden awakening to the power of cinema. Like suddenly these big wigs said, hold up, we can use the cinema to promote good Christian American values. Let's censor it. Enter here the production code of 1934. The production code, or the Hayes Code as some people call it, essentially had three main principles and then it got specific. No picture shall be produced that will lower the moral standards of those who see it. Hence the sympathy of the audience should never be thrown to the side of crime, wrongdoing, evil or sin. Essentially a film should show characters of good morals, but again, quotation marks, because what does good morals mean? And it should never leave the audience on the side of criminal characters of evil or Sin. Correct standards of life, subject only to the requirements of drama and entertainment, shall be presented. And finally, law, natural or human, shall not be ridiculed, nor shall sympathy be created for its violation. The one that I and many film scholars look at here is the correct standards of life. Because honey, what does that mean? One of the core principles of the production code was that the sanctuary of the institution of marriage and the home shall be upheld. Pictures shall not infer that low forms of sexual relationship are the accepted or common thing. Basically, the code said films should not show people having sex unless it was I in a heterosexual marriage. I I for procreation. Popping a baby out. And if you're sat there like Luke, come on, you're being way dramatic. The code was not even okay with kissing. Extensive and lustful kissing, lustful embraces, suggestive postures and gestures are not to be shown. What is the suggestive posture? Of course, to no one's surprise, racism and homophobia were rife in the production code. Any depiction of homosexuality was prohibited. In the actual wording of the production code itself, homosexuality is listed under sexual perversion because back then it was considered a mental illness in 1930s America. Psychoanalysts thought it was a mental illness, hence why it was perceived under sex perversion. The code even said no to STDs. Mention of venereal diseases are not subjects of motion picture. The production code basically dictated 
needed every single aspect of American life because like I said before, Hollywood cinema was so incredibly powerful and influential. Of course the code did have backlash from creatives but it was also very strict. If films didn't get the green tick from the code's creators, boom, it was banned. The production code was censorship to the limits, to the max. However, did creatives follow this? Hell no. It's too easy to read that decree and think, oh, so gay people were banned from Hollywood cinema for the 30 plus years that the code was in place for. <laughs> Filmmakers did find ways to get around the provisions of the code. You could launch so many case studies and investigations on race, on gender, on all the representations that the code prohibited, but I focus specifically on homosexuality because that has one of the most lasting legacies in film today. Essentially, filmmakers use connotation in place of denotation when depicting homosexuality. Denotation is the literal. It's what something actually is. It's me with a sign right here that says homosexual. Whereas connotation is what something symbolizes, something that it makes you feel, something that it may represent. Connotation has a lot of subjectivity to it. For example, me sat here with a rainbow headband, that connotes pride and thus homosexuality. And you could then infer that I'm a homosexual, but it's not the denotation. It's not me sat here with a sign that says homosexual. It's connotation. It's what it symbolizes. Through different associations, you could read the subtext here that I am a homosexual or you could also not see it that way and that's the beauty of you know audience infer on how different people perceive things differently you may perceive me as supporting the NHS or doing something for you know the coronavirus it's not something explicit it's subtextual um, but my receiving hairline is explicit <laughs> and clearly I'm not saying the gays and lesbians of Hollywood in the 1930s 40s were walking around with rainbow headbands and speedos for goodness sake it was quite the opposite the place where gay and lesbian characters thrived in early Hollywood cinema like 1940s was the thriller and horror genre and there are clear links here to homosexuals being perceived as mentally ill or mysterious or not normal. Gays and lesbians were allowed to be permitted in films like Hitchcock films if they were coded in there. The characters never referred to themselves as homosexual. Take Mrs. Danvers in Rebecca or Brandon Phillip in Rope. The mysterious killer threatening homosexuals that could never fit into society. The characters are never once referred to as homosexual but it's just heavily implied. In cinema then, for some characters, homosexuality becomes the subtext. And this continued for the longest time. Then when the production code was revisited and revised slightly in September of 1966, it then said that homosexuality could be depicted so long as it was done with care, discretion and restraint. Simply, a character may say they're gay, but they must be condemned. Yes, eventually the code was abolished and abandoned a few years later, but it didn't stop there. The effects of that lasted, you could argue, up to this day. The mysterious closeted killers of the 1940s became the overt killers of the 1980s. They then became the comical lesbian vampires of the 2000s. This continued for the longest time because what the production code taught filmmakers and people was correct or okay. And this ideology doesn't just go away at the snap of a finger. You should always keep this in mind when watching Hollywood films, doesn't matter when from, just to know, you know, this is what people thought or were led to believe was the correct way of living in America. And that message from the production code was white, heterosexual and married. And of course there are anomalies and rare occurrences and people can just perceive different films differently anyway. What I perceive as homophobic, you may not. You know, there are different experiences that people bring to film or YouTube videos anyway. That censorship in Hollywood film really did have such a lasting and damaging effect that's thankfully being rectified today. And cinema is very different today, but still, especially in terms of LGBTQ representation, there's still not that much of it in Hollywood cinema. And there's still little things where you can trace back to the production code, but I'll leave that for you guys to, you know, examine and decide yourselves. I'm just stating the facts. Thank you guys so very much for watching this video. If you did enjoy it, please give it a big fat thumbs up and subscribe to the Study Tube project. Share, you know, your favorite, I guess, LGBTQ representation in Hollywood cinema. Share a Hollywood film that you think was an anomaly that broke that mold. And while you're here, make sure you subscribe to my personal channel and follow me on my own social medias while, you know, I'm living and thriving. Thank you guys again so much for watching and I really, really hope you enjoyed it.